Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Entwistle Community Church. Welcome to everyone here this morning and to those who are new as well. We're so glad you've joined us this morning. I'm going to start off uh, the service with just reading a little bit uh, from Isaiah 6, uh, talking about the holiness of the Lord. Last week we celebrated the resurrection, and what a wonder it is to contemplate, as Michael is talking about, how mind-blowing it can be sometimes to really just think about the resurrection. But when you think about who God is, it just in really, just reading through Isaiah here, it says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We're going to sing holy, holy, holy. And as we sing it, let's just listen to the words that we're singing and just contemplate on how holy our risen God is.
in order to see God's holiness, we need to ask him to open the eyes of our heart to see who he truly is. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Won't you open the eyes of my heart? I want to see you. I want to see you. Let's sing it again. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Won't you open the eyes of my heart? I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Won't you open the eyes of my heart? I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, won't you open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love. Moving on to Holy Spirit, once we see who God is, once we understand His holiness, we ask the Holy Spirit to come and help us to live the life that God has asked us to live.
strivings into works of grace. Breath of God, show Christ in all I do. Holy Spirit, from creation's birth, giving life to all that God has made. Show your power once again on earth, cause your church to hunger for your ways. Let the pick this last song here just because it is the essence of God that lives in us that makes Christianity what it is. It says, they shall know us by our love, and when we have asked the Holy Spirit into our lives, there is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place amongst those who believe and follow him.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Entwistle Community Church. Isn't this a wonderful day the Lord has given us? It's just fantastic spring day. Welcome to everyone here and online. Um, And uh, my name is Monica, and I am part of the Entwistle Community Church Board. And it is my honor to lead you in prayer this morning. Um, Kids, don't forget to remind me when it's time for children's church. I always forget that. And I'll also be here at the end of the service in the prayer room if anyone would like individual prayer. It's been one of those seasons. We've just had Easter and the resurrection. And I was talking with Pastor Micah about what we could pray for today. And the Lord led me to Matthew 28, 16 to 20. It's often known as the Great Commission. It was the last words in Matthew where God gave instruction, and I will read it for us. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Uh, For me, that's a very moving passage. It really sums a lot of stuff up, and especially the mission of this church. As a church this month, we've been asked to pray for the Baptist General Conference of Alberta, specifically for the churches and leaders we partner with, to see the gospel spread. The BGCA is comprised of 29 churches that serve in rural, urban, and small town contexts in Alberta. Pastor gave us several areas to pray for, and we're going to do something that we haven't done for a while in this church, and I'm going to read to you each item to pray for, and I would like you to, as a family, or if you have a partner, or a new friend to pray with, I am going to read the item, and I would invite you to pray, and if you're uncomfortable, just bow your head and pray on your own, because God hears all our prayers. So if you'd like to join in your little groups with each other, Heavenly Father, please hear the words of this congregation as we lift our voices to you. The first that we want to pray for, Lord, is that BGCA churches will align in God's mission to make disciples for Jesus Christ in places near and far. I invite you to pray, and then I'll give the second.
Pray that the leaders of the BGCA would be empowered by God to fulfill their mandate to help establish and empower missional, disciple-making leaders and churches. Pray that God was, would raise up leaders in local churches such as ours to work for the kingdom and that God would provide the resources to sustain us. Pray that recent church plants would flourish in their dis disciple-making efforts and more churches would be planted. Pray for our BGCA leader, Dennis Gully. And lastly, pray for wisdom and guidance for the upcoming annual district gathering.
And while our heads are bowed, I, I will finish in prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we, your humble servants, give our most heartfelt thanks for all your goodness, love, and mercy. We pray for your creation and all the blessings of this life. Most of all, the overwhelming love you have shown us in the redemption of the world by our Lord and Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. We offer our prayers for the church worldwide, that it may be guide, guided and governed by your Holy Spirit. We ask that you keep the ministers and the congregations committed to your gospel safe, healthy, and filled with your blessings. We pray for all our governments, that they would walk in your ways, so that they and we would prosper in all just works, so that peace, happiness, truth, righteousness, and the gospel may be established among us. Loving Father, we pray for our local church in this season of change. Fill our board, ministries, and congregation with wisdom, with discernment that would make your will known to us and them. We celebrate with sadness and yet joy for the commission you have placed on our beloved Pastor Micah and his family. Keep them safe and bless them that they may prosper in their new church and home. And for all of those here and at home, in whatever they are suffering, their grief or illness be, give them your comfort, peace, patience, and if it be your will, healing. Hear us, O merciful Father, in our humble requests, which we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to him we give all the honor and the glory. Amen. Great ages three to grade three, off you go. To the children's church, I see Miss Rebecca's going. You'll have a lot of fun. And I think I'm done. Thank you, Monica. Well, good morning, everyone. He is risen. Amen. Let's keep celebrating that reality. Um, we're going to be jumping into a new sermon series looking at more of the resurrection. And what we're going to be studying is really what are the post-resurrection experiences of Jesus. And we're going to be looking at these stories of transformation, these stories of how when Jesus met people post-resurrection, it absolutely changed everything in their life. It absolutely transformed their entire world. And as we think about this, who here has had their life absolutely transformed by Jesus? Amen? Amen. That's such good news. That's why we're here. That's why we exist to know and experience what God has for us. And so I'm really excited for this new series. I was debating what to call it, and I sort of came to the title, New Beginnings. And it's with this perspective that when Jesus meets people in his resurrected state, it brings about a new beginning. And it brings about a new beginning for the church, a new beginning for the people of God. And as we as a church are, are setting off in a season of change, uh, I know it's going to be a new beginning for us as a family, and I know it's going to be a new beginning for you as a church. And as much as grief and sorrow that brings, it's also something to celebrate, amen? And so we're going to be looking at some of these profound stories of what happens with the resurrection of Jesus. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn to John 20. John chapter 20. And we're going to be looking at the story of Jesus and Mary post-resurrection. And as you turn there, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, what does the Gospel of John begin with? What is the first line of the Gospel of John? In the beginning was the Word, right? And as we begin the Gospel of John saying in the beginning, what is the Gospel author intending us to bring, bringing us back to? What story? Why does he say in the beginning? He brings us back to the creation account, right? Which, which tells us something about some of the themes of the Gospel of John. Uh, before we jump into our text, what often when we do with Scripture, uh, one of the goals of reading Scripture to read it is in its context. 
And so often when we read a verse, to fully understand the verse that we read, we need to understand what the chapter is talking about. And when we read a chapter of Scripture, we need to often recognize what the whole book is about, right? And what we'll find is that these details and these themes begin to emerge as we read things in their context. And as we read books of the Bible, we read them in the context of all of Scripture, right? Which talks about the story of Jesus. And so I bring up that question because there's something we're going to be examining this morning that is a theme of the entire Gospel of John. And that theme starts right at John 1.1, which says, In the beginning was the Word, which brings us back to the creation account. It brings us back to the story of Adam and Eve. Where are they? In the garden, right? And they have this call by God as humanity. They're supposed to um, take care of creation, right? They have this cultural mandate. They have this calling to have dominion over creation, to function as gardeners in the garden. And yet we read in that story, is humanity successful in that calling, in that vocation that God had given them? No. And it tells us that Adam, Adam, humanity had failed. And so keep that in the back of your mind as we read this text, because I'm going to bring out something um, that hopefully is quite profound to you. So let's begin. John 20. I'm going to begin in verses 11, and we're going to read down to verses 18. So John 20, verse 11, says, But Mary, Mary Magdalene, stood weeping outside the tomb. Now what context are we in? She's weeping because Jesus has just experienced crucifixion. He's just experienced this unjust trial which put him to death on the cross, and he was laid in this tomb. And so Mary goes, and she's weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. So what's Mary's first implication? She comes to the tomb. She sees that it's empty. What's her first thought? Someone's stolen the body. It's gone, right? What has happened? It says, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she didn't know it was Jesus. Now, here's what's wild about the gospel accounts before I go on. When we look at the tomb story, it doesn't specifically say it in this story, but one of the fascinating things about when the empty tomb is walked upon and they begin to examine the tomb, what do we see laying down there? Yeah, the burial cloths, right? Now, that's a very fascinating little piece of historical evidence because when we read the story of Lazarus, we see him being resurrected by Jesus and he's sort of all mangled and tied up still coming out of the tomb. And yet there's this historical piece of evidence that the, the writers of the gospel put that the tomb had these burial clothes folded very specifically as if Jesus sort of took them off as he resurrected and folded them nicely. But that is the context in which we're walking in. And so she's looking for Jesus. She's longing to find him. She's wondering where he is. She looks around, and Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be what? The gardener. We're going to deep dive into that. We're going to get there. But supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. 
And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Amen? Beautiful story, beautiful story. One of the first post-resurrection stories that we see in Scripture. And so we read about the story of Mary, the very first person to experience the resurrected Jesus, the very first person to witness Jesus. And we find her in this garden, and as she's in this garden, she sees someone as she's looking for Jesus. And who does she see? Who does she think she sees? She thinks she sees a gardener. Now, there's a lot of logical reasons why we could assume that she would see this. Perhaps Mary could not recognize Jesus because her eyes were filled with tears. She was weeping. Her eyesight would have been blurry. So perhaps that's why she couldn't recognize Jesus for who he was. Perhaps her mind could not comprehend that Jesus had defeated death, and so this idea of a resurrected Jesus just couldn't be fathomed by her. Perhaps Jesus was seen as a gardener because he would have been covered in the muck of dirt in his fingernails, in his hair from burial. And so there's all these reasons logically why she would have seen him as a gardener. But the interesting thing to me is why would John include this very specific detail in his gospel account? Of all the things that could be said and needed to be said about Jesus and his post-resurrected state, why would this specific detail be so emphasized by the gospel of John? Well, again, how does the gospel of John start? In the beginning, what is a major theme of the Gospel of John? Creation. What is happening here is there's this framework that Mary doesn't even realize at this point of time. She has no way to comprehend it. She has no way to see it, to fathom it. But what she is seeing is actually profoundly, deeply, theologically. See, John takes us back to the creation account. And Jesus was raised on what day of the week? Does anyone know? The first day of the week. The theological implication there too. Why was the tomb in a garden? In the Garden of Gethsemane? Because it's bringing us back to the Garden of Eden. You guys making these connections? It's profound. Just as much Genesis 1 and 2 is a story of creation, John wants us to understand that Jesus was with God before the creation of the world, and then he chose to become a part of creation in his, what we call the incarnation, Jesus taking on flesh. Jesus enters earth as a human being. But Jesus doesn't just come into creation, he actually deeply affects all of creation itself. And so what is this pattern that we see in the Gospel of John? Let me, let me expand this theme for us to understand what's going on here. And so we see in the beginning, Jesus was with God and Jesus was God, right? We see this divinity that Jesus himself is the creator of the cosmos. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made, as John says. And then we read through the Gospel of John and we have all this imagery of creation, of plants and seeds and vines and vegetation. And Jesus tells the disciples very something specific. And this is in John chapter 15. John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the vine and my father is what? The gardener. Isn't that interesting? John 15, 1, I am the vine, my father is the gardener. 
And so John is bringing us back to this creation account. So again, we need to think of the Garden of Eden. The, the Garden of Eden tells us what humanity's original calling and task was. They were to care for creation. They were to care for the garden of this cosmos. And Jesus is mistaken as the gardener. Isn't that ironic? Jesus is the gardener. Why? Because he is fulfilling everything that humans were created to be and do that we could not do. Isn't that wild? So even, even in this context, it's wild. Even in the scene in chapter 20, Jesus is functioning, so to say, as a new Adam. Just as Adam had failed in the task in the garden, Jesus is a functioning as a new Adam who has not failed. And so we, we see these two angels guard the tomb. And, and what do we see in the Garden of Eden? Who's guarding the garden? The two angels, cherubim, right? So many deep connections here. This new Eve does not disobey as Eve did, but this new Eve renamed as Mary is faithful to what Jesus calls her to at the end of the story. And so we see this deep thematic understanding of new creation here. And so G.K. Chesterton, he says this. He has this phenomenal little book called The Everlasting Man. And in it he writes, On the third day the friends of Christ, coming at daybreak to the place, they found the grave empty and the stone rolled away. In varying ways they realized the new wonder. The world had died in the night. The cosmos had died, so to say. And what they were looking at was the first day of a new what? A new creation with a new heaven and a new earth and an assemblance of a gardener God walked again in the garden, not in the cool of the evening as Genesis describes, but in the dawn, the dawn of a new creation. It's wild. And so when we read John chapter 20 here, and we come to the scene of, of Jesus' first interaction in his post-resurrected state. We, we see him show up literally as a gardener. See, somehow these two, two connections between gardens with the story of Adam who failed as a gardener and Jesus who comes to bring new life and succeeding as a gardener. See, this is why we read in Paul, in his letter to the church in Corinth, he says this. He reads these, he recites these words to connect Adam and Jesus. He says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He's celebrating the resurrection. But in Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of all those who have fallen asleep. Then it says, for since death affecting all of creation, came through a man. And who was that man? Adam. So since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man in Jesus. For as in Adam all, does anyone know, all die. All die in Adam. But in Christ, all will be made alive. Isn't that beautiful to think about? All will be made alive. And that's not just all people. That is all of creation. There's a cosmic perspective to what is going on here in the resurrection. And so Jesus is the creator of the cosmos who has given this vocation to humanity who failed. And yet he comes as the God who recreates and reorients the life of the cosmos to the purposes of God. And so, again, the, the first Adam was the, the gardener who failed in his task. 
And what was the result? The world became what? A wasteland of sin and despair and injustice and evil. A world of selfishness and greed and lust. But the second Adam brings a new creation. And what is this new creation? A world of peace and justice and love and prosperity and forgiveness. So Christ comes to literally restore the ruined and decimated garden. Isn't that wild to think about? You guys staying with me? I know it's a massive theme. Well, this is obviously a theme that has been picked up in the history of art. Anyone recognize this painting? Maybe recognize the artist? Rembrandt? Well, here's a, here's a fascinating piece, and I, was, I sort of went on a rabbit trail looking at some of the historical art depictions of Jesus as the gardener. And really where we see it really prime up is in the Renaissance area, actually. Uh, but this one's Rembrandt, but really it's this depiction of Mary's first interaction, and I love the, the historical art because it tells us something theological about the story as well. Because it places Mary back in the garden, and she thinks she sees the gardener. But as you see, Rembrandt and many other Christian artists throughout the ages have depicted Jesus as a literal what? What does he look like? He is a gardener. He's got a sort of sun hat, sombrero. He's got some tools and a shovel, right? And, and what the depiction is, is what Mary thought she saw was way beyond her comprehension because the reality of the situation was that what she saw was actually fully true. That even though she mistaken Jesus as a gardener, he fully was the gardener. But not the gardener of just the Garden of Gethsemane, he was the gardener of all creation. And so with this image, with this picture as gardener, let's, let's frame it a little bit more for us. What does a gardener do? I know a lot of you out there are gardeners. I know some of you are even master gardeners. What does a gardener do? What is their vocation? What is their calling? What is their purpose? Okay, maybe one at a time. That was a good response, but that was just a wave of answers. Pardon, Bob? Yeah, take away the bad from the good. So this picking of weeds, right? Separating the plant from the weeds, things that will choke and ruin. What? Yeah, yeah, they deal with bad seeds. Yeah, they take care of what's there. And taking care of it probably makes something of beauty or something that produces something of value. To do that, what do you need to do? You need to work. You need to hoe. You need to get your fingers down and dirty, right? What else do you need to do? You need to trim. You need to prune. You need to plant just to start, right? You need to harvest, right? There's, there's all these imageries that we know and we've experienced with the role of gardening in our lives. And, and what's wild about this picture of Jesus is this picture of Jesus as gardener is literally He is the God who does that for all of creation. And, and one of the, the, the pictures that I have in my, my mind too is is gardeners really have to get their hands dirty, don't they? Their, their hands have to be in the dirt. And, and going back to the creation account too, I mean, it tells us that humanity is made up of what? The dirt, the dust, right? And, and then we look at this picture of Jesus, and this picture of Jesus is literally coming to this world, which is full of dirt and grum and weeds, and he enters into all of that dirt in a very literal sense. And I think it's this, this beautiful picture 
of what the incarnation is and what Jesus does as this vision, this picture of the gardener of creation. Now, what does that mean for our lives then? Not just the cosmos, but for our lives. What does it mean if Jesus is the gardener in each and every one of us? Yeah, we become new creation, but how does that new creation come about? Well, a gardener has to till soil. They have to turn soil. And when we think about tilling and toiling in our lives, sometimes that tilling is painful. Why? Because he digs into us, so to say. He digs out all the weeds. He he digs out all the threats for our flourishing. He breaks up the dirt clots. And sometimes that pruning and prodding and digging becomes overwhelming for us. And yet we realize that Jesus' intent for each and every one of us is that we would flourish and that we would become bloomed of what we were created to do. And so Jesus is this picture of the one who cuts back dead limbs. He prunes. He prunes at times things in our lives that seem good to us. He prunes at times things that we wish we could hold on to. He prunes at times things that we wish we would never lose. But Jesus is working each and every one of our lives to take away the things that threaten goodness, to take away the things that threaten forgiveness, to take away the things that threaten new creation itself. Because what we see from this gardener The purpose of what Jesus is doing in the cosmetic gardening is to literally bring about what? New creation itself. That is John's major emphasis here, is that Jesus comes to bring new creation. And so, what does new creation look like? Why does it matter that Jesus rose from the dead? What is he actually accomplishing? Well, new creation looks like overcoming addiction, amen? You become a whole new person. New creation looks like relational reconciliation. New creation looks like confession and admittance of sins to prune out those weeds. New creation looks like forgiveness and even at times restoration. New creation looks like giving up control of our life and trusting God. New creation looks like stepping out into the unknown and the uncertain, knowing that God will be with you. New creation looks like a deep sense of security in your identity in Christ. And new creation looks like knowing your value and dignity and the value and dignity of others created in the image of God. New creation changes everything. And we get to experience this new creation because, why? God keeps reaching down into the dirt of humanity. Amen? Isn't that good news? That's the only reason why we can experience new creation. That's the only reason why our lives can be transformed because God is a God who keeps reaching down into the dirt of humanity and pulling us out of the graves that we have created for ourselves through violence through gossip, through slander, through injustice, through evil, through selfishness. And yet God keeps loving us back to life over and over again. Now, Mary sees God. Let's go to the next thought. Mary sees God himself in Jesus. God is the creator of the cosmos. God who is bringing about new creation through his resurrection Not just new creation in each of our individual lives of those who follow Him, but literally new creation for everything. And so Mary sees Jesus, and what do we see Jesus say to her? Mary. Mary. Now there's a fascinating little bit of language going on here. Uh, The New Testament scholar N.T. Wright brought this out and it was quite profound to me. So I want to share it with you guys. See, Jesus doesn't say the name 
that has been spoken of Mary throughout the Gospel of John up until now. And the, the framework of the, the way that John has been using the name Mary has been more like Maria, the Greek name, the name that the Roman soldiers would have called her. But now, in this context here in chapter 20, there's an entirely different name used for Mary here. And it's Miriam. Miriam. Isn't that interesting? This is her original name. This is her Hebrew name. This is the name she was always really called. And so Jesus calls her through her tears by her true name. Now, think of this story again through the light of new creation. Mary had this identity that was given to her through this name. And yet that identity was taken from her from some Greek-speaking Roman soldiers who was taken from her from the reputation she held in the empire. And yet Jesus calls her by her true name. He calls her to a new identity. And he calls her to this new purpose and calling. See, again, this theme of new creation is even in just the way that Jesus calls her name. That's how deep this theme is going right now. See, Jesus calling to Mary to give her a new identity brings us back again to the first creation account. Because what was Adam's first responsibility as the taker of the garden? Take care of the animals, and what was he supposed to do with the animals? He was supposed to name them. That was one of the first vocations that he had. He was supposed to name them. The first Adam named the creatures. And now, what do we see Jesus doing here? The second Adam, Jesus, is literally renaming his creation. He is literally renaming the people of God, giving them a new identity, as we see first of all here in Mary, giving them a new purpose, giving them a new life, giving them a new hope that Mary thought was lost, and giving them a new creation. Do you guys see how deep this theme is going? It is absolutely wild. And this is why we say, when you follow Jesus, everything changes. Because when we follow Jesus, all these things come true for us now. When we follow Jesus, we, we finally get to find the identity that we were created with. In a world that tells us we get to create our own identity, which leaves us lost and fractured and confused and depressed and despair because we can never find the identity we long for, it brings us back to the identity that we were created in the image of God with value and dignity and purpose and meaning. We have this new purpose that comes from following Jesus. And again, in a world of secularism, which tells us that we have to create a purpose, which ultimately, as I share a lot from Albert Camus, my favorite atheist philosopher, life over time becomes meaningless because you will be forgotten, the stars will explode, and no one will know you ever existed. And yet Jesus infuses purpose infuses purpose, infuses this new life. He infuses this new hope. Mary is a woman who was in despair. She thought all was lost. Everything she had devoted her life to in following Jesus was taken at the crucifixion. And yet now the promise of new creation and new life is given first and foremost to her. See, Jesus absolutely changes everything for us. Now, let's bring something else up. Let's look at this next part of the passage. John 20, 17, 18. So Mary realizes that it's Jesus. She didn't fathom the, the depth of understanding the gardener, but John fills in that detail. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
Now, now this isn't Jesus sort of pushing her aside. This isn't Jesus being dismissive of her. This is Jesus preparing her. Why? Because what's Jesus about to do after his resurrection? The ascension, right? Returning to his father. He doesn't want Mary's expectation to think that she can cling on to him forever in a physical sense because he would tell the disciples, I am sending something greater. What would be greater? The Holy Spirit, amen? So he's preparing her. And now he sends her. And he sends her by saying, but go to my brothers, my brothers, the disciples, the apostles, the people that had literally abandoned him. And yet, what does Jesus still call them? Brothers. There's still a love. There's still a family relationship. There's even this restoration and recreation of their identity. Instead of being those who slandered Jesus, who turned against him, who rebelled against him, who betrayed him, who abandoned him, instead of all those identity markers, Jesus gives them a new identity as brothers. And he says, say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. The resurrection happened. And and that he had said these things to her. So a wild, a wild amount to unpack here. There's so much depth to what's going on here. So Jesus literally calls Mary, and the first thing he does is sends her. The first thing he does is saying, now that you understand resurrection is a reality, and now that you understand things have come into fruition, everything that I said will come true. He says, you need to go tell the disciples about this. Now, Mary calls the apostles, the disciples. And she proclaims to them the gospel because Jesus has given her a mission. Jesus has given her a calling. Jesus has given her this desire to proclaim and preach the good news. And what's fascinating to me about this story is who who remembers what apostles mean? What does apostle mean? Sent one, right? Mary here literally becomes the apostle to the apostles. Fathom that for a second. Isn't that beautiful? And, and we see Mary taking this role. Now, who would we expect? We, we would expect Peter. We would expect John. We would expect James to be the first announcers of this important message, and yet Mary becomes the apostle to the apostles, the one who is called the first evangelist the first preacher of the gospel. And Jesus sends her and he calls her to be that agent because now she becomes a participant in new creation. She becomes a participant and an agent of new creation by calling her brothers and sisters to the mission of God to work with Jesus as the gardener to set the world right again. That is the mission that was given to her. And the beautiful thing is Jesus started creation. Jesus created the garden. He continued the restoration of the garden. And now we see him calling his people into the mission of to be agents of this new creation. See, John 20 in the story of Mary It's the scene that reminds us of the Garden of Eden. And it reminds us that what was lost will one day be restored. And what was lost has already begun to be working towards what God originally desired. And the calling that Jesus has for his people... The good news that Mary was supposed to proclaim to disciples was that because Jesus has resurrected from the dead, now the people of God become new creation and they themselves get to work towards new creation. Where we see this new creation becoming reconciliation between 
God and humans. Reconciliation between us and one another. Reconciliation between ourselves and reconciliation even with creation itself. That is the good news of what Jesus has brought into recreation. And so we see this this beautiful description of Jesus bringing creation back to everything it was supposed to be and calling his people to do the same. Good news, amen? amen? Let me close with one more thought. What does this have to do with us? How does this reframe our understanding? Well, this story of Jesus' resurrection... The story of Mary, this picture of the garden scene where the gardener of creation has literally come back to take ownership of what was lost, of what was broken, of what was fractured. It means that when we are in Christ, we are a new creation. In other words, our identity has changed, our purpose has changed, our mission has changed, everything, our perspective has changed, everything we exist for has changed. We literally become new creation when we are in Christ. And the calling we have then is to partner with the gardener, so to say. To partner with the gardener. To see all the elements of new creation come into fruition. To see the recreation of this world. See, this is what we long for. This is what we hope for. This is what gives us perspective on everything. Let me close with one final thought. Um, I was reading Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion. Anyone heard of that book before? Richard Dawkins is quite a, a prominent atheist, naturalist. And he writes this book, and what really struck me in the introduction was, was I came across this quote that he had And he writes this, and he he has this little quote from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I don't know if anyone has seen that movie before. It's sort of a classic. And he quotes this thought from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He says, isn't it enough to see that a garden is beautiful without believing there are fairies at the bottom of it too? And what he's saying is, can't we just look at this world and say, what a beautiful garden, without having to believe in the supernatural, without having to believe that there is a God who created it, without having to believe that God has done something profound. And yet, when we think about it, a garden, by definition, needs what? A gardener, right? And I remember reading that thought for the first time from Dawkins, before I even got into the substance of his book, and it was basically not even an introduction, and I was like, he's already contradicting himself with this thought. If we look at this cosmos as a beautiful garden, what's the implication? There has to be a gardener who is taking for it, who is cultivating, who is bringing something of beauty and order out of the chaos. And I thought, what a, what a strange picture. You, you see, when we look at this world as a beautiful garden, I don't see it like an imaginary little fairy tale in a, a fairy as Dawkins sort of equates it to, but I do see so much evidence of a creator, of a God who created this world to see the order and the beauty of the cosmos. And we realize a garden by definition is a tamed piece of earth. And as soon as we see it, as soon as we see weeds plucked, as soon as we see flowers in a row, as soon as we see the oceans pushed back by the mountains, we say, where's the gardener? Where's the gardener? And so just uh, looking at this cosmos... We come to the realization and this deep sense of of trust that there is a God who created this world. There is a creator who is sustaining this world. 
Sadly, we as humans who are also created beings are the ones who have brought destruction. We have mistreated creation itself even. We have mistreated one another. We have mistreated our relationship with God. And yet our hope and the hope that Mary early discovered and proclaimed to the rest of the disciples, which birthed the church at a rate we can't even fathom, was because there is a hope that the creator, the gardener, has come to reorder, to reconcile, and to renew, and to recreate everything that was lost. And that is the beautiful perspective that we can see in this first resurrection account of Jesus. So let's pray to that extent. Oh, gracious Father, our Creator God, our Gardener, we look to this cosmos, we look to this creation with awe and wonder because You have brought such beauty, You have brought such order, You have brought so much magnificence. And yet we realize that we as humans, we as sinful beings, have fractured and broken and distorted and ruined so much of the good that you created. And Lord, we thank you that because you are a God of mercy, that you did not destroy us for destroying your good creation. But instead, you make us new creation as you work towards new creation. And we thank you that as we look at the story of resurrection, Lord, the good news isn't just that one day we get to escape this place and go to a place called heaven, but the good news is that you are God who is restoring and reordering and reconciling and renewing and recreating all things. That means no how, no matter how broken or fractured or dirty even we think our lives are, we know that you are a God who will enter into that dirt. You are a God who will enter into that muck. You are a God who will enter into that disorder and dysfunction and you can bring about beauty. You can bring about restoration. You can bring about healing. You can bring about the things that we long for and yet we can't obtain in our own power, in our own will. And so, Lord, we we pray that as we look to the story of resurrection, as we look to the story of Mary, that we would see our identity absolutely transformed, our purpose in this life to work towards new creation absolutely transformed. Our understanding of who you are as a God who is a gardener would restore our vision of you and restore our vision of ourselves. And so let us see this world through your eyes. Let us see ourselves through your eyes. And let us see the hope of the future through your eyes who has set this beautiful hope before us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ the first fruits, as Scripture describes, of all creation, the first fruits of things being made new and things being made right. And so as agents of this new creation, we pray that you would empower us by your Spirit to work for justice, to work for mercy, to work for forgiveness, to work for love, to work for peace, knowing that it brings honor and glory to you, our Creator God. We love you, our gracious Father, and it's in the beautiful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together. Speed.
lift his voices. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall Amen. Amen. You guys can take a quick seat. That's a prayer for us as we we pray, establish the work of our hands, realizing that it's the work of God that will last. And guess what will last? The hope is that the work of new creation will last. That is what will last in the kingdom of God. And when we work towards those things, those things are going to last into eternity, which gives them a deep sense of meaning and value and purpose. Um, We have a couple announcements before you head out from here. Uh, The first one being uh, the ladies' women's retreat. And so I'm going to call up Nikki for a quick announcement. Hi, guys. So it is springtime, which means that it is the ladies' retreat. We are, again, doing a one-day 9.30 to 5 retreat, the first Saturday in June, June Oh, third. 
Um, so today, or this year's theme is Let Go and Let God, Renewing Your Trust in the Lord Through Prayer, His Word, and Your Community. Join other women for a one-day conference to discover a renewed trust in who God is and what he's doing in your life. Women from our community and beyond will share how they stay connected through prayer, through reading the Bible, journaling, and listening, and how we connect within our communities to show our faith in the Lord. So, let me get out my notepad. Um, make sure I tell you guys everything. Tickets will be on sale April 29th and May 6th out in the um, foyer for the early bird. So then tickets will be $50. After that, after I come back from vacation, tickets go up because you have to deal with me. So it'll be $60. <laughs> Okay, um, there are a limited amount of tickets, just like last year. Uh, we will have two speakers. We'll be doing a prayer activity, a Bible activity. There will be door prizes, gift bags, and more. Uh, lunch is going to be made by Valerie Craddock, so it's worth your ticket price right there. Um, if you'd like to help with her, so either preparing or helping the morning of, please connect with her as soon as possible so she can get everything organized. And if you would like to bless someone else with a ticket as you're buying yours, we are doing that. And so um, just connect with me um, if you don't already buy it at the early bird time. And I think that's it. We'll see you guys there. Awesome. Thank you, Nikki. I would say I'm excited for that, but I can't go anyway. So. <laughs> um, we also have a Senior Supper coming up Friday, April 21st, and this is just a night where we want to bless the seniors in our community and the seasons beyond our church, our seniors beyond our church family as well. And so if you want to reserve a seat for that night, talk to Renee. Uh, she has uh, tickets set up for that as well. Um, I do have one more announcement too from Wes Craddock, our board chair. Let's give him a hand. Woohoo. Thanks, Micah. Uh, just a couple things to share with you guys. Um, first of all, Micah, thanks for your perspective today with the message. It's uh, really encouraging and a, and a great way to, to look at that. So thank you. And Jared, thank you for the leading of the worship. Beautiful music. We love that. Uh, yep. Worship and prayer is uh, such an important part of Christian life, and um, I just would like to encourage those of you who are prayer warriors in the crowd. Um, a friend of ours, a uh, member of the church, our, um, our brother Rene, has been struggling with his health and has decided instead of uh, trying to endure more treatment for his cancer. He is choosing to go to hospice and spend the remainder of his time uh, with his family. So i just like to encourage you to be in prayer for that, um, for comfort, for peace, and just for rest. The other thing that I wanted to remind you is that uh, the search committee is working to try and bring a new shepherd to our, our church. Uh, we want to be in prayer for that, for the advisory team, and uh, just the board as we go through these new stages. Be in prayer for Micah and Rebecca and his family as they leave, and for the new shepherd that God is bringing to us. And, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Since Mike is leaving, we're going to have to send him away with a, a bit of a pat on the back. So some of you have been asking me about what is being planned for the Brookhart Farewell. This is something that the board is going to be planning, and uh, we'll bring you some more updates as they come. But as it is right now, Micah's last day will be May 28th, and that day we will also be having a potluck, and uh, there are some ideas of... Uh, what we can put together for him. So we'll give you some uh, updates on that next week, and uh, hopefully we can have all of your participation in that. So I look forward to seeing you next week for prayer time, and uh, hope you have a good rest of your day. Awesome. Thank you, Wes.
Okay, I think we have one more announcement, but we can't post it online for its a missions update. So blessings to you online. Lori, come up with a missions update.